Welcome to Simplifying Synthesis, the channel where we look at complex organic chemistry and explain how it works. Today, we are going to look at the total synthesis of dimeric securonega alkaloids, fluganines D and I. This work was carried out by the Han Group at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. The securonega alkaloids have been isolated from plants from several different genera, most notably flugia, which gives its name to these compounds and have been the targets of total syntheses for over six decades. These alkaloids have a wide structural diversity, but typically contain a tetracyclic framework containing an alpha-beta unsaturated ester and a tertiary amine group. These features are present in the two target molecules of this study, which consist of two of these tetracyclic subunits dimerized together. Both fluganines D and I share the same carbon framework, with the only difference being the methoxy group appended to fluganine I in place of the alkene present in fluganine D. So first, let's look at the synthetic strategy. The authors envisioned that the tetracyclic tertiary amines could be installed late in the synthesis, after the east and west fragments had been coupled together using a stillery reaction. This stillery reaction would connect two key intermediates, the electrophilic and the nucleophilic coupling partners, which will be constructed separately with complete control of the stereochemistry. The retrosynthesis of the electrophilic coupling partner begins with disconnecting the iodobutinolide ring to the cyclohexane highlight in orange, which had previously been synthesized. Disconnecting the acetate group and the alpha-beta saturated bond leaves a pyrrole diene intermediate, which ultimately can be derived from the wine rib amide of proline, a building block from the chiral pool, which possesses a single stereocenter, which will be used to relay chiral control to the other stereocenters throughout the synthesis. For the retrosynthesis of the nucleophilic coupling partner, it is first disconnected at the stanyl group, which is required for the stilly coupling. This can be made from an alpha-beta unsaturated cyclohexanone, which bears a 1,2 trans diol oxidation pattern. Using oxidation and reduction chemistry, this can be derived from the same acetylated cyclohexanone, which is used for the electrophile synthesis. So now, let's move on to the forward reaction sequence. The synthesis of the electrophilic partner begins with the Grignard addition of homoallyl magnesium bromide to the Bach protected proline wine rib amide. A common problem that arises with Grignard reactions of acids and amides is over addition to form a tertiary alcohol. Wine rib amides overcome this issue by forming a five membered magnesium chelated ring after the addition of one equivalent of Grignard reagent. This chelate is stable at low temperatures and prevents another equivalent of the Grignard from adding. Quenching this reaction at a low temperature allows the target ketone to be formed without over-addition. Notably, the chiral center did not undergo racemization during the reaction, something which could have occurred due to the acidic alpha proton of the proline ring and the highly basic Grignard reagent. The next reaction involved the installation of an enone adjacent to the carbonyl group which is already present in the molecule. This requires the use of an umpelong synthon, that is, a molecule which reacts with a charge opposite to that which the group typically exhibits. In this case, the carbon bonded to the oxygen, which typically carries a partial positive charge, reacts as a negatively charged nucleophile. This is accomplished by using methoxyalene, a molecule which is deprotonated using butyl lithium, which adds to the proline carbonyl group to form a carbon-carbon bond. Upon hydrolysis with hydrochloric acid and tautomerism, the methoxyalene group forms the desired enone. This reaction produces only one diastereomer due to the addition of the nucleophile to the less sterically hindered front face of the molecule. With the synthesis of the diene complete, the next step was the formation of a cyclohexane ring. This was accomplished by using an olefin metathesis reaction using the Grubbs II catalyst. The reaction begins with the coordination of the more nucleophilic alkene to the catalyst, following the loss of the phosphine ligand. A 2 plus 2 cycloaddition occurs between this alkene and the methylene ligand present on the metal centre. 
This is followed by a retro 2 plus 2 cycloreversion, which produces an alkene by the exchange of a carbon from the substrate to the methylene ligand and leaves the substrate bound to the ruthenium centre. The newly formed alkene is then displaced by the other olefin present on the molecule, and yet another 2 plus 2 cycloaddition occurs. This four membered metallocycle undergoes a retro 2 plus 2 cycloreversion as before, and the target cyclohexanone is produced, leaving a methylene group present on the catalyst, which can then go on to react further as the catalytic cycle begins again. Overall, the reaction causes the loss of ethylene from the substrate and the formation of a new ring. With the cyclohexanone in hand, the next stage of the synthesis was to oxidize the ring at the gamma position. TMS triflate was used to activate the carbonyl group and create a strong electrophilic center, which allowed for the conjugate deprotonation of the gamma position, thus forming a beta-gamma unsaturated silyl enol ether. The alpha hydroxyl group present in the molecule was also silylated during this reaction. Dimethyl dioxorane was then used to install an epoxide on the beta-gamma alkene. TMS ether was then hydrolyzed and this triggered the reversion of the enol ether to an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone, coupled with the opening of the epoxide ring to produce the desired alcohol. The alcohol was acetylated using acetic anhydride, and the alpha hydroxyl group was deprotected with hydrogen fluoride to complete the sequence. It was crucial that the DMDO oxidation was stereoselective. In this reaction, only one diastereomer was produced. The origin of this stereo control is the steric hindrance from the proline group present on the molecule. This blocks one face of the ring, which only allows one easily accessible approach for DMDO, which undergoes a concerted reaction mechanism that requires an overlap of the pi homo orbital with the oxygen lumo orbital in the correct orientation for the reaction to occur. The next stage of the synthesis was to construct the iodobutinolide ring. To this end, Phenoxydichloroethane was reacted with Bewley, first to promote a syn-periplanar elimination to form an alkyne, and then again to deprotonate this alkyne to produce a nucleophile which underwent direct addition to the carbonyl centre. A cyclization occurred upon treatment with N-iodosuccinamide and silica to produce the target butinolide. The authors proposed two possible mechanisms for the formation of the butinolide ring. The first is an iodine-promoted Meyer-Schuster rearrangement. This involves the activation of the aryl inol ether by iodinium to generate a ketinium intermediate. This highly reactive electrophile then forms a cyclobutene with the geminal hydroxy group, which undergoes a retro 2 plus 2 ring opening to produce an alpha-beta unsaturated ester. Transesterification with the alpha hydroxyl group forms the desired butinolide ring. The second reaction mechanism proposed by the authors is an iodine promoted 5 endo dig cyclization. As with the previous mechanism, the first step is the activation of the alkyne by the iodinium ion supplied by the N iodosuccinamide. The alpha hydroxyl group then attacks the activated alkyne to form a five membered ring, a five endo dig process, which is favored by Baldwin's rules of ring closure. The remaining hydroxyl group is then activated with a Lewis acid, which could be a proton, an iodinium ion, or the silica present in the reaction. This can then be eliminated, coupled with the migration of the double bond and the attack of succinamide on the phenyl group to produce the target iodobutinolide. The construction of the iodobutinolide ring completes the synthesis of the electrophilic coupling partner. Moving on, we can now turn our attention to the synthesis of the nucleophilic coupling partner. This begins with a loose reduction of the previously synthesized acetylated cyclohexanol. The loose reduction uses sodium borohydride and cerium trichloride to selectively reduce the carbonyl group in preference to the conjugate reduction of the alkene. The loose reduction proved to be diastereoselective for the trans diol product. This result can be rationalized by examining the mechanism of the reaction. The cerium coordinates to the carbonyl oxygen and also to the alpha hydroxyl group. The incoming borohydride is then directed by electrostatic interactions 
to deliver the hydrite from the bottom face of the ring, an effect which is further reinforced by steric hindrance of the proline group which blocks the top face. The secondary alcohol produced by the Lusch reduction was then selectively protected with triethylsilyltriflate, a group which is too bulky to also protect the tertiary alcohol present in the molecule. The acetate group was then cleaved to unmask the secondary hydroxyl group. With this secondary hydroxyl group now revealed, it was then oxidized to a ketone using a Lay oxidation. The TES group was then deprotected to produce the desired 1,2 trans diol and complete the redox sequence. So let's take a look at the Lay oxidation in detail. The Lay oxidation uses tetrapropyl ammonium pyruthinate more commonly known as TPAP, as a catalyst to oxidize the secondary alcohol, together with the elimination of water and the reduction of ruthenium-7 to ruthenium-5. N-methylmorphaline is a stoichiometric oxidant which reoxidizes the ruthenium back to ruthenium-7, which can then repeat the cycle. It is possible for the ruthenium-5 species to disproportionate into ruthenium-6 and ruthenium-4, which is present as ruthenium oxide. Commercial samples of TPAP contain trace amounts of ruthenium oxide, which is able to serve as a co-catalyst. Interestingly, studies into the mechanism of the TPAP oxidation using pure samples of the catalyst show an initial lag phase in the reaction kinetics, which is not present when commercial samples of TPAP are used. This is attributed to the presence of ruthenium oxide in the commercial samples which speed up this initial phase of the reaction. Now, with the correct oxidation pattern in place, the authors turned their attention to installing the iodine required for the silly coupling. Iodine and pyridine was sufficient to complete the desired transformation by generating an iodinium ion, which is attacked by the alkene to form a cyclic iodinium intermediate. Deprotonation of the alpha carbon restores the double bond and leaves the iodide bonded in the alpha position. The final step in the preparation of the nucleophilic coupling partner was the introduction of a tributyl stanyl group. A palladium catalyst was used in this reaction, which first undergoes oxidative addition into the carbon iodine bond of the substrate. This tributyl tin reacts with this palladium 2 complex, which undergoes a transmetallation process to leave tributyl tin bound to the palladium centre. Reductive elimination liberates the target stanylated compound and palladium zero, which can then react further. This completes the synthesis of the nucleophilic and electrophilic coupling partners and brings us to the end of part one. Click the link for part two, where we can see how the synthesis was completed. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe.